Jesse is really up to you. You want to you want to pound these guys with questions. Um, we have a couple of recitation things in the afternoon, uh, which we will arrange kind of as we go along. But you are certainly free to ask questions during the lecture. Um, why, why am I? Maybe you should turn off the mic here because uh, I'm going to turn the volume down. Oh, yeah, turn the volume down. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, good. Uh, let's see. The room is very awkward. They tried to jam as many seats in here as they could. And so if you're over by where Pedro is, and uh, Raphael is writing over here, it's not going to work. So what you kind of want to do is spread to the back and maybe, you know, sit on the bar stools in the back and things like that. Okay. Um, I didn't design it. That's the way it is. Uh, let's see. Let me introduce some useful people. So Pedro is way over there. Uh, me, uh, we have locals here, Oliver DeWolf, uh, ADS CFT person, uh, Shanta Diolis, is Shanta here? No, he's around, you'll see locals with, you know, on their name tags. Uh, let's see, uh, Sherry Namburi, okay, there she is. Uh, she is really, really important. Uh, if you have to push papers, her office is in the tower over here, that's the Gamoff Tower on the third floor, okay, uh, and that's where you will find her. Uh, let's see, local graduate students, uh, Will J, Oscar Hendrickson, uh, Dan Hackett, is Andrea here? No, okay. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, the audiovisual guy, where did he, oh, over here, yeah, Bobby Roo. Um, if you have, I'm sorry, every year something happens to one or two videos, and you know, I just like that. Um, if you send an email to tassie at colorado.edu, it will filter back and we'll see what we can do. Is there a better address, do you think? Um, I have my direct email on the website where we'll be posting the videos. Well. Great. Okay, so you go to the web page and you're looking at the videos and there's something there. And we'll do the best that we can. Okay, that's all we can do. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, I need two volunteers to run student seminars. It's become a tradition at Tassie that you guys want to talk to each other. We have nothing to do with this, okay? But I need two volunteers, and if you come and talk to me, say, at the coffee break, then I will send you off to Sherry to get right access uh, to the appropriate part of the wiki page. Um, we have this room right here pretty much until 10 o'clock at night, okay? There's another room down in the basement which we'll use when we double up on, on the discussion sections next week. Um, uh, yeah, I am told, we are told the building is open, that you can get in here until reasonably late at night. If that's not true, you tell us the next day and we'll, we'll follow on it, but I think that's the case. Um, in the past, these, these things got very, very long and you didn't have time, students, your, your predecessors did not have time for important things like, you know, like, like playing Frisbee and, um, you know, enjoying the local culture. And so a few years ago, one of the directors clamped down hard and we would appreciate it if you would, you would take this person out of the past and channel him. So I would say that a typical student seminar is the following. Uh, hello, my name is Tom DeGrand. I'm at the University of Colorado. I have done numerical simulations of n equals four super yang mills. Read my preprint. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and you always don't get involved in these hour-long talks where you're explaining minutia of what you're doing. Okay. Done. You know, so that you can impress all of your friends. Because just, just don't. Please don't do that. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, there's a public lecture on June 17th. Uh, that's Joe Polchinski. He'll be talking about firewalls. Uh, firewalls are a very interesting thing. It'll be even more interesting seeing the uh, local retired residents of Boulder here asking him questions. Uh, we're, I mean, last year the room was packed. Uh, there'll be a group photo uh, June 16th before morning coffee. We'll walk in and we'll shout at you, don't, you know, don't drink coffee yet, go outside, and then we'll stand there and we'll be reported for posterity. Um, there's an opening reception tonight at the top of the Gamoff Tower. That's this tower over here, okay, across the street from the football stadium. Uh, you go in at the base and take the elevator up to the top floor, and it starts at 7. Right, okay. Bring your name tag. We have extremely onerous alcohol regulations at this campus because in the past, the University of Colorado has been the number one party school in the country, okay? <laughs> and, the, and the administration resented that. Okay, and so they respond in uh, tough ways. So bring your name tag. Uh, let's see. Actually, you need the name tag for three things. You need it for the reception. You need it for the cookout next week, and you need it for the banquet. And it's all because you know you can have a glass of something at any of them. Uh, you notice I am wearing this very strange T-shirt. If you can't see it in the back of the room, I had another <laughs> strange T-shirt on last night. Uh, every year, the students design a T-shirt. 
Okay, my role in the t-shirt is to purchase one for every speaker, so you'll be giving your shirt size to Sherry. <laughs> I think you should do a hat. I have a lot of t-shirts, but, um, but never mind. Uh, I, don't th has there ever, I don't think there has ever been a Cassie that did not do some item of memorabilia. You will have to self-organize to do that, okay? I, I just tell you. Uh, let's see, uh, proceedings. Um, we would like to do a proceedings. That really is the job of the, uh, of the, of the or scientific organizers to bug the scientific lecturers. Okay. I will say just to start things off, uh, anytime I'm interested in something and there was a TASI talk on it sometime in the past, I go read the TASI proceedings. I mean, you know, maybe you do that too. I don't know. But in order for that to happen, they have to write things up. So what you have to do is really hammer these people out at, at mealtime. You know, this was really great, but I got to see it written down, okay? And then hope that it sticks. And you have to hammer these guys so that they will hammer these guys so that they will do something. We have, we have money for our proceedings. That's, that's, that's not an issue. Uh, similarly, with posting things, uh, hopefully people will get their notes online, you know, a day or two after because you're always revising things. Uh, if they don't, again, you are closer to the, to the lecturers than I am, okay? So, and you are more important, so you bother the, uh, the, the lecturers to get their uh, lecture notes up. Uh, let's see, hiking. I'll announce what we're doing on Thursday. We have to watch the weather and see what we're doing. Uh, let's see, finally, before we turn it over to Pedro, uh, Dabdokar couldn't get a visa, okay? And, uh, and then, uh, uh, Juan missed his flight yesterday, so the schedule this week is an imaginary creature, okay? And we're going to make things up as we go along. And with that, I turn it over to Pedro. Okay, thank you, everyone. So I don't have much to say. I think Juan really said everything. So let me just uh, give a brief mention, as Tom said, that given that we have many discussion slots this week, what we will do is some of the speakers have a very ambitious outline that is impossible to do in four lectures. We'll give them one more slot and uh, we will just fill in the slots as we need. And yeah, please do take advantage of the lectures, ask lots of questions, and uh, I think we can learn about the technical theory. Okay, thanks. Quarter past nine. So we're ready. Oh. <laughs> I just have one thing for the people that missed yesterday. Can I take your folder during the year so that we can get it? Okay, well, first, let me thank Pedro and uh, the Tom, the organizers, for the invitation to, to come here. I was a student here uh, uh, some, some time ago. And uh, I really enjoyed Tarsi. I have fond memories of the, of the lectures and of playing soccer and hiking. So there was already time, I guess, to do other things. But <coughs> uh, I think 2005, I couldn't be sure, but I think 2005. No, I think you were already here. I, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, so maybe then it was 2007. But I, I, I was here at some point anyway. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you also uh, enjoy TASI, the lectures, the, the outdoors. And um, uh, yeah, so let me get started then with uh, effective field theory. So I was asked by, by Pedro to talk about uh, or give four lectures on effective field theory. And effective field theory really is a tool that you can apply to many different things. It's really more of a, a tool than anything else. You can apply it to many physical systems. And this also means that you cannot really review the whole topic of effective field theory and all its applications in four lectures. So necessarily my lectures are somewhat focused in on one direction. The direction I got from Pedro was that I should eventually make contact with the uh, effective field theories for long string-like objects that we've been working on with uh, Sergei Dubovsky and Viktor Gorbenko. Such string-like objects would be uh, QCD strings or uh, cosmic strings, any string like defect in a, in a field theory. And so my lectures will be somewhat geared toward that. And it also means they leave out some other things that one really should maybe cover in lectures on effective field theory. And for this purpose, so you get a more a global overview, I gave you some additional resources. And as Tom said, the TASI lectures are usually very good resources. So there's a number of previous uh, TASI lecture notes on effective field theory. There's a nice set of lectures by Joe Polchinski, by Ira Rothstein, by uh, Vitek Skiba, 
And they're already all on, on different topics, so it's worth just looking at them to see what you can do. There's a nice review for the, for the general idea by George I. When I was a student, I, I enjoyed this review, uh, or lecture notes by, by Pitch. Then there's the lectures by Kaplan and Burgess, and you already see that they're posted to different archives. So you see that there's many different topics that you can actually apply them to. If you'd rather watch something online or read something, there's also lecture no, uh, lectures online by Ian Stewart at MIT, which mostly focus on soft collinear effective field theories, which I have nothing to say about in, in my lectures. So there's a lot of stuff available, and I'll mostly try to include all the necessary things you need to understand what we did in these effective field theories for long string-like objects. And I should also say, as we go along, uh, please feel free to ask me questions. Also tell me if my writing is too small. This is even kind of small to me, so yeah, so <laughs> I realize that. So I, I'll, I'll try to write bigger. And remind me, because I might forget as I go along. Um, and yeah, as I said, so if anything looks wrong or if you have questions, just let me know. And so then let's get started with the part that I called introduction. And this already too small, I suppose. <coughs> and I think one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, physics, I don't know if you agree, but one of the aspects that I find very fascinating is that it really gives us a, a quantitative way of describing the world on a huge range of scales. We can describe physics all the way from the size of the, uh, the observable universe, which I'll call 10 to the uh, 33 centimeters, and let me call this the Hubble scale, all the way to, let's say, uh, 10 to the minus 19 or 10 to the minus 20 centimeters at the LHC, where we're probing electroweak symmetry breaking. And there's really interesting physics on uh, most scales in between, so you have you, can, you might be interested in studying galaxy clusters at 10 to the 25 centimeters. So there's galaxy clusters. You can study individual, uh, and I don't know, uh, Leonardo might talk about effective field theories for, for large scale structures. So this would apply somewhere on these, on these large scales. You can study galaxies or uh, star clusters, stars, solar systems, planets, people, and so on eventually. So there's a lot of stuff in between. Eventually you get to a scale that we're all very familiar with from atomic physics, 10 to the minus 10 centimeters. There's a lot of applications of effective field theories. So you have atoms, then eventually you have nuclei, nuclear physics. And uh, <coughs> it even allows us to, to speculate about physics at even higher energies. And it seems that there is something interesting going on at a scale of maybe 10 to the minus 31 centimeters. The, the couplings of the standard model or the supersymmetric standard model seem to unify somewhere around here. So maybe there's some grand unification going on. Also, if you look at the neutrino masses, it's possible that they were generated somewhere here, that there is some heavy particle that was uh, responsible for their masses. So maybe the origin of neutrino mass is somewhere here. And this scale also is interesting in the context of inflation. In the most naive or the simplest uh, models of inflation, uh, you get pointed to, to this kind of energy scale. And we can even study a uh, higher energy scale. So there's a 10 to the minus, let's call it 32, maybe the string scale. And at even higher energies, quantum gravity and whatnot. And uh, the dream is, of course, that someday we might have some unified uh, theory, some theory of everything that really describes <laughs> physics on, on all these scales. And the even more ambitious dream would be that that final theory is so simple that it uh, allows you to calculate all, uh, all these processes in much simpler ways than we're currently computing them. Uh, if, if history is any guide, that it probably won't be that way. We might find a, a final theory, but it probably won't be that useful if you want to compute planetary motions or if you want to compute anything about the, the hydrogen atom uh, and so on. And so the, presumably, it will still be true, even if we were to find such a theory, that physics 
provides us a, a quantitative description of the world with the help of effective, uh, field theor uh, effective theories that are valid in some finite range of scales in certain regimes. So physics And for this to be useful, of course, the, the ranges of uh, validity somehow have to overlap. So you can compute in one theory and then uh, the other one. And uh, you've seen many examples of uh, effective descriptions. So I'm not sure if I have to give you too many examples. But maybe one, one simple example is just a multiple expansion you might do to understand So these are examples. Multiple expansion to understand the effect of a complex charge distribu distribution. So there's some charge distribution rho, and you want to understand what is it, it, its effect on a, a point-like charge over here. Let's say this is some size r, and then the distance here is d. And we're interested in the regime where d is much bigger than the size of the charge distribution, then we can approximate the, the potential the, of, for this charge distribution as the charge over 4 pi x plus, and then the multiple, uh, the dipole. And then dot, 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 where the dot, 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 in this case, because I am ending here at the, at the dipole, goes like r over d squared. So there's the quadrupole, octopole, and so on. This is one thing. And typically, so the reason this is useful is because you're only interested in this potential to some certain amount of precision, maybe to 1%, 1 per mil. And then you can just truncate the series uh, at some point. The, another example is, uh, is uh, Newtonian gravity. as an effective description of general relativity. And this is valid as long as the velocities are small, so v is much less than 1. And we have weak gravitational fields. And there's many more examples. I mean, for example, when you're in your Newtonian gravity, compute the, the energy, the static, uh, the potential energy of some object that you lift up and you write as m times g times h. You're ignoring that the Earth is a sphere. You're also ignoring that the Earth is not quite a sphere. You're ignoring that there's other objects around, that there's the moon, the sun, and so on. So we're always really working in some, some expansion like this where we're ignoring uh, the other things. And this works because. We're only interested in some finite amount of precision. And effective field theory is really a, a tool that allows you to do these kind of expansions in a very systematic way and to also estimate the, the errors you're making in these, uh, in these expansions.
was this? In this. <laughs> I see. Okay, and uh, as I said, there's many different types of effective field theories. The, the ones I need, in a way, are the, the, the simplest field theories and also the, the most traditional ones. So in my lectures, I'll focus on what are known as low energy effective field theories. And in this case, we'll have both uh, quantum mechanics and relativity be important. So these will be described by, uh, these will be uh, relativistic quantum field theories. Uh, but the idea of effective field theory really uh, goes beyond this, and it ho uh, hopefully this will become clear. But you can also find it in in the lecture. So, but the uh, so you can extend this to both. non-relativistic and or classical systems. Okay, and as I said, so you can find examples in, in these notes. So for example, IRA gives, uh, well, the first one actually is already an example of non-relativistic systems, so it uh, describes Fermi liquids. IRA also talks about effective field theories for non-relativistic effective field theories for, for QED, et cetera. So you, you can find some of the additional information if you want in, in, those, in those lectures. So OK, so I'll talk now about these low energy effective field theories and try to describe them in, in some detail. And I thought, so we start on the, on the same page. I would briefly remind you about relativistic quantum theories in general. So, because really the, the structure is fairly, uh, it, you cannot really change it all that much. It just comes out naturally from the principles of, of quantum mechanics and, and relativity. And if it's obvious to you, then that's good. Uh, if not, I'll try to briefly, briefly give you the argument. So from quantum mechanics, and I, I hope this is familiar to most people. If it's not, please also still ask questions. I mean, I, I hope every, everyone can, can follow what I'm saying. So from quantum mechanics, uh, we know that symmetry transformations are represented by either unitary linear or anti-unitary anti-linear operators. And 
uh, in particular, if you have a, a continuous symmetry group, a Lie group, let's call it G, then uh, we expect, so first of all, if, you, if you're in the component that's connected to, uh, that contains the identity, then the operators, because you can get uh, continuously to the other elements uh, in that component, the, it has to be a unitary operator associated with elements. And you expect that if you uh, first apply one of them and then the other one, then this should be the same thing that you get uh, or the same thing you assign to the product of these two elements in the group, possibly up to a phase. Because we are only really sensitive to or we can only measure probabilities in, the, in quantum mechanics. And so we have a, a unitary projective representation of our group. And this also means that we can classify the, the states in our Hilbert space according to these unitary projective representations of our group G. So, So these unitary projective representations. Okay, so now let me wipe. And how does this work with this one? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see if it writes on here. Okay. So in the in from the relativistic theory. We know that our symmetry group, G, at least contains the, the Poincaré group, and then possibly internal symmetries. And so we will be able to classify our states according to the unitary uh, projective representations of the Poincaré group. And typically what we do is we pick some uh, uh, a complete set of commuting observables, which we might choose to be the, the generators of, of translations, P mu, and then the Cartan algebra of our internal symmetry group. And then we can classify the, our states according to the, to the eigenvalues. And we get states that look like this. And uh, the eigenvalues of the momentum operator. So they look like this. P mu. And in general, these alpha, these labels alpha are continuous. For example, if you have multiple particles, you will have relative momenta. If they're discrete and the representation if is irreducible, then we call it a particle.
And under our Lorentz transformations, it transforms in the following way. So we can uh, apply a boost and then translate the state, and we get something that looks like this, e to the i a lambda p. And then here, this is the uh, representation the thing transforms in. Let's call it spin j for now. And then the little group element that leaves the standard four vector for this type of particle invariant. And then lambda p s prime. And this is just labeling the, the type of particle. OK, now one thing I wanted to point out about these things is uh, that this can really be any, any type of uh, uh, particle that is an eigenstate of the, the Hamiltonian. So it could be an electron, or it could be a proton. Uh, it can also be uh, a hydrogen atom in the 1s state. Anything that's, that's stable, really, sh you should be able to, to describe in, in this way. But this one is quick. Oh, yeah. I mean, you like it. And the it contrast. Seems like it, would, it seems like it would be longer. <laughs> but the contrast is so good. You're going to set a very high bar for all the other speakers. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so yeah, so this can describe any, any stable particle, really. It doesn't have to be anything elementary, which is good, because we, we really have no idea if the electron is an elementary particle or not. And um, similarly, if we have a, a free theory, We can define n-particle states that uh, that just transform in the uh, product representation. And I don't know if I should write it all out, but so. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's much too small, probably. Should I write it further down? But really, these are just the, the same spins. So S1 prime that is being summed over here. Um, OK, and the same is true for any, uh, any type of uh, state in which the, the particles are essentially free. So in particular, it also applies to the in and out states where the particles are free because they're far away from each other, either in the infinite past or the infinite future. So this also applies. In and in and out states. OK. Um, are there any questions so far while I erase? What is, sorry? What is w? w is the, the little group element. So I can, in terms of the underlying Lorentz transformations, uh, what you have is that you can define your uh, momentum p as some standard boost applied to some standard four vector. And this gives you some. So we define p mu as some L of p mu nu times some standard four vector, where the standard four vector for a massive particle would just be m0, 0, 0, 0. And then this is just a standardized boost. You can pick it. It's your choice. That takes you to, to this guy. What w then is, w of lambda and p is the transformation that looks like this, lambda L of p. So you take uh, the, sta the standard uh, for momentum 
the, the momentum P, then you boost it, and then you do the, the inverse, so you get back to the standard four momentum. So this is some element of the little group, which is the group that leaves your standard four momentum invariant. For massive particles, it would be just the group of rotations. SO3 is the thing that leaves M000 invariant. For massless particles, you would have here K, 0, 0, K. And then the group that leaves it invariant is the Euclidean group in two dimensions. For a particle, in the traditional sense, you don't want the, the uh, non-compact part, the translations. You want to get rid of them. And you only keep the SO2 part as the little group for the massless particles. Any more questions? Okay, so the next thing we should uh, try to see is how we include uh, or what the observables are in, in this theory. And the first observable is the S matrix, which is just the transition amplitude or the probability amplitude for going from some initial state, P1, Pn, to some final state, P1 prime to Pn prime. So it's just really the tra uh, transition amplitude between our out state out, meaning it looks like still too small? OK. This size is good. I'll, I'll try to. And the second set of, of observables that I'll talk about. So in addition to just measuring these kind of uh, observables, which are not particularly local, you send something in, you, you see what's coming out. You might also expect that to be local observables. You might be able to, to measure the energy density of your system, or you might have some order parameter that you're trying to measure. So we should also have local observables. And like the energy density and anything else you can think of, some charge densities. And for these, causality imposes interesting uh, constraints. So if you imagine having uh, two observers with their labs, one over here in region R1, one over here in region R2. And this is, so this is time and this is space. Then if these regions are uh, space-like separated, there's no way we can exchange information between the two. And uh, what should happen is that the local observables that these guys measure should commute with the local observables that these guys measure just because really they should simultaneously be able to do their measurements, which means that the observables should commute. So we have. And you might include uh, fermionic uh, operators into the definition. So if it's two fermions, you take the anti-commutator. If, uh, if it involves a boson, you take the commutator. So this should vanish for f 
for regions R1, R2, if they're space-like separated. And of course, we can imagine making the region smaller and smaller, and then uh, it, it eventually putting them, uh, defining them at a point. So we have these observables, O of x, let's call them, let's i and j or something like this. So observables have to commute or anti-commute as long as x minus y uh, and y are, are space-like. So in my uh, conventions, it means that this uh, x minus y squared will be negative, which means right now I'm using plus, minus, minus, minus metric. And this is uh, often referred as uh, micro-causality. Any more questions? Well, right now, I guess let's take everything to be gauge invariant operators. Is that what you mean? Or? Um, I think this is still true, but I mean, maybe if anyone else has a different opinion, I think micro causality should still hold. Um, I, I'm not saying anything about the Hilbert space factorizing, I don't think. Perhaps a related question. Yeah. What do you work out with the, 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 the electron field? Yeah, okay. So right now, let me stick to gauge invariant observables, in which case it doesn't uh, count. Uh, in In practice, yeah, anyway, let me stick to gauge invariant observables. <laughs> okay, so then uh, an interesting class of observables, so, uh, these local operators, A local operators which I'll call phi i of x, let's say, even though the x just gives the plane wave by translational invariance, and then you have some type of particle here, and it gives you e to the minus i px times the, the one particle wave function. And for, for a scalar, it's just one. And these are interesting because the, the LSC theorem relates the correlation functions of these things to the S matrix. So what you can uh, write, let me take put it here maybe because you need some space.
And actually, let me write it for scalar so it's less of a mess. And then let me write it in a way that it's at least clear how it would generalize to other particles. So it allows you to move uh, particles out. So I took the one particle and, and turned it into this kind of thing. And you can keep going. And you get that this is i to the n plus n prime. And then you have a, a product of all these wave functions. So this, in, again, for the scalar guy, is just e to the minus i p 1 x. Uh, so we sum over all the. Uh, particles in the in state, and then we're also summing over all the product over all the particles in the out state. These are called y. And then we have all the And then what's left is the time order product of these guys. And so what it means, or in diagrammatically, what you're doing is you're stripping off, in, in your diagram, you're stripping off the external propagator and you're multi multiplying it by the wave function. And this is also true for the fermion. So you're stripping off the external propagator multiplied by the wave function. Yes? Uh, so what's phi star in the first integral? Phi star. So I have this operator. If you remember, I defined, is it still here somewhere? Yeah. So I had, this was the, the phi, some operator that uh, has this kind of overlap <coughs> with the particle. And it's just the complex conjugate of, of this oh. guy or the Hermitian adjoint. And so in, in other words, well, and strictly speaking, so I was sloppy here. So this one is the out state. This one is the in state. And strictly speaking, there should be minus the thing with both the, the in states. So this is really just giving you the part of the S matrix that's not the one. And in other words, you can think of the scattering amplitudes as the, the residue of the, uh, of the leading pole of the Fourier transform of the vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of these operators in the limit where the momenta here uh, go, go on shell. Okay. And notice also that this works for, for any operator with, uh, with the property that I <laughs> just erased. Uh, and it also works for, for composite particles as long as you have an operator that has overlap with this, with this state. OK, and so then one way you might compute this 
is if you have some underlying theory uh, with some microscopic degrees of freedom, you might compute this time-ordered product of a bunch of these uh, fields. as the, the path integral over whatever the variables are in your theory. Let's call it something like quarks and, and gauge fields. Uh, and then you have these operators, which could be composites, again, of uh, uh, up and down type quarks with a gamma 5 in between, for example, if you want to make a pion, et cetera. Okay, so this was the review of the uh, quantum field theory part, and hopefully most of it is familiar. But if you have questions, please let me know. And so then let's talk about the idea of the low energy effective field theory. And the idea, in a sense, is very easy to, to state. So the, the idea is that I should also be able to compute this in this way, where I treat these now as fields in my, in my action with some effective action, the low energy effective action for these things. in the limit at least in which I'm using it in this formula with all the PIs uh, being small. And we'll see what small means in a sense uh, in a second. And then uh, there's many, uh, many cases uh, where you can actually uh, go from this description to this description. We'll see one, uh, one example. This goes by the, by the name of, of matching or integrating out the, the heavy particles. But for example, for the, for the pions, we can't really go from uh, this description directly to, to this description. Um, and we just write down the most uh, general uh, action here. So I'll tell you in a, in a second now why this makes sense. But is there any uh, questions uh, about this part? But this is the basic statement, that you should also be able to write it in, in this way. And then compute the S matrix using these phi's in the same way as we did before. Okay, so why might this make sense? And to, to see why it might make sense, uh, 
let's consider a, a scattering amplitude in a theory that's somewhat simple, but it will capture most of uh, what we're interested in. So the theory will have a, a gap. So you have some lightest particle of mass m. Oh, this one. Yeah, so let's consider for phi phi, let's say goes to phi phi in some theory where we have a gap. This guy has mass m, or let's call it m phi. And then there might be other particles uh, with masses that are larger than this. Then what we expect the scattering amplitude to look like is, unless there's any z2 symmetries of this guy, we expect in that scattering amplitude that there is a, a pole. At, so this is the complex S plane. We expect that to be a pole at m phi squared. And then we expect that to be a, a branch point. So all the, this thing, this scattering amplitude is analytic up to uh, poles and branch cuts that arise from when intermediate states go on shell. One thing that can go on shell is the, the guy itself. If we don't have a Z2 symmetry, then you can also have two of the guys going on shell. This gives rise to branch cuts. The, the branch cut would start at 4 m phi squared, and then we have a branch cut going out. The next one would be somewhere when we have three of these phi particles going on shell. So we might have some other branch cut starting at 9 m phi squared. And then in, uh, in a theory that has ad additional massive states, we might also have uh, a heavy guy that can go uh, uh, on shell, well, two of them. So you might have another branch cut starting here at four capital M squared. And so let's say we're interested only in the scattering amplitude at energies below this, then all the, the singularities, all the poles and cuts really are contained in, in the phi sector. And you know that the uh, uh, field theory you can think of as a, a, a tool that generates for you the most general S matrix compatible with unitarity analyticity in the sense that you only have the uh, poles and branch cuts from, from the, the particles in your theory. That, so it generates uh, an S matrix compatible with unitarity analyticity and the symmetries you feed in. And this also means that at these low energies you should be able so the, the amplitude in this case here is, is analytic. So we can write the amplitude in the presence of this heavy guy as the amplitude where this guy is taken all the way to infinity plus and then some Cn, S, T, U to some power n over for n squared, for m squared to the power n. And the, the fact that you only have uh, things in the numerator is because the, the amplitude should be, should be analytic there. And since we can generate the most general uh, scattering amplitude from our, uh, from, our, uh, from our field theories, we should be able to generate this. And the fact that this uh, appears only in the, in the numerator because of analyticity actually means that our theory should be, should be local. So this means what we expect this effective field theory to look like is really just a, a local thing. So it's integral d for x, and then we have our kinetic term, and then we have our mass term. And then we have, let me call them these operators like this. So there's some coefficients. And then we have, let's say, d to the n phi to the m schematically over 
m uh, to the n plus m minus 4. It's too small? Oh, there's no, no fancy light in this one. Yeah. Sorry, should I write it again somewhere else? Here? And so this is what we expect. Does that make sense? The next, so this still doesn't seem so useful because we have an, an infinite number of, uh, of these terms that we have in our action. So it's unclear if it will be useful in any way. And so we'll have to understand how these terms actually contribute to observables we're interested in, like the, the scattering amplitudes. And this goes by the name of, of power counting, which is really an essential ingredient of, the, of these effective field theories, because in principle, you have an infinite number of operators that you're allowed to add, and you have to figure out which ones to keep and which ones not to keep. And this will be set by the amount of precision you're interested in. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so And let's, uh, let's consider the, the amplitude again, and let's imagine writing all possible diagrams for it. And in a given diagram, let's call the number of external lines E. So this is the number of external lines. Then I, I'll call the number of internal lines. Then we have V and M is the number of vertices of type in M, where N again is for me what I, I use to count the, the derivatives, M what I use to count the fields. And then we also have the number of loops. And then we can work out the scattering amplitude at a, in terms of these things, so the contribution to the scattering amplitude in terms of these things. And the scattering amplitude for each, for each loop, we get d4p over 2 pi to the 4 integrated. So we have this to the elf power for each loop. Then for each of the internal propagators, we get 1 over p squared to the power of the internal lines. And now we have to take care of the, of the vertices. From the vertices, we get 1 over m squared to the sum over n plus m. And then it's n plus m minus 4 over 2 
Vn m. So here I'm just using that they appeared like this with this with this denominator. And this denominator I just put in because derivatives in this case have dimension one and fields have dimension one. So each one I have to cancel. And it, it's a term that appears in the action that's integrated against the d4x. So this gives the, the minus, minus four here. And then for each of the for each of these things, I had uh, n derivatives, so I get p squared p squared to the n over two times v n m. And the good thing is that these things, these numbers, are not all unrelated. The two relations come from first from the fact that uh, lines have to end on vertices. We have, first of all, lines end on vertices. So we have the number of external lines plus two times the number of internal lines has to be the, and then there's an M because they contain M fields. This you can use to solve for, for I, if you want, for the number of internal lines. And then we have from topology we get that the total number of vertices minus the number of internal lines plus the number of loops is equal to 1. Did I miss it actually? How much time do I have? Ah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so and if you plug these all in, you find well there's the uh, sixteen pi squares, which are can be helpful, but and then uh we get some piece. Let me not do the algebra on the board. But. Okay, you get this answer. And then some of it is just fixed by, by the number of external legs you have. And then the rest really it tells you which, how a given a set of operators contributes. And you see that anything for which n plus m is greater than or equal, 
the, uh, greater than four is suppressed by the, the heavy mass in the, in the problem. So it's suppressed by the heavy scale. And this really was the, more generally, is the scaling dimension of the, the operator. So operators with dimension higher than four uh, lead to, to these suppressions. And to any given order in p squared over m squared, it's only a finite number of uh, terms that we have to actually compute or include in our action. OK, so this effective field theory then really, to a given order, this action uh, becomes relatively simple. And this is why it's, why it's useful. And in fact, things are even slightly better than this, because not all operators contribute. There's operators that are called redundant operators. So let me briefly mention that, and then I'll stop. And here, I guess I start here. So let's say you have an action that, for one reason or another, is in a form like this. So it's uh, some zeroth order thing. It doesn't have to be quadratic in phi. It's just zeroth order in something. And then some term that's small. Uh, let me pull out the small thing. And let me call it epsilon s1 of phi plus, and then terms of higher order in epsilon. Now let's see what happens if we have a, an operator in S1 of the form some functional of phi. And then it's proportional to the equations of motion that follow from this part of the action. Then what we can do, we know from the LSE uh, theorem that our S matrix is invariant under a, a, a field redefinition. Phi goes to phi plus some higher uh, powers of phi. So let's see what we can do with the field redefinition here. one in the back now I can't move up did anyone have everyone have a chance to copy this part okay let me uh. So let's consider a field redefinition. And let's see what happens to our action. So then s goes to s naught of phi plus integral d4x delta s naught delta phi times epsilon delta phi plus epsilon, the term in S1 was
delta phi. So this was the term in, in S1. Plus terms of order epsilon squared. And so you see that if you choose the delta phi to be minus f, the term completely disappears from the action to this order. You move it to higher orders. But because the S matrix was invariant under, under this change of, uh, of variables, it also means this term doesn't contribute to the, to the S matrix at all. It doesn't really mean you have to remove it. Whether or not you remove it, it just won't contribute to the S matrix. That's what this statement is. If you want, you can do the field redefinition and remove it. Even if you don't remove it, it just doesn't contribute to the S matrix. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so then I think since I'm out of time, I'll just end here and then continue tomorrow. Anything that's proportional to the lower order field equations, I guess, are, are these kind of operators. So this means if you have a, a massless scalar, for example, anything that involves box, uh, box phi, you will be able to, to get rid of. It won't contribute. You can also see it because w if, it, if you insert, I mean, if you try to compute an S matrix element with that thing and it acts on the external state, it just doesn't contribute. I mean, because of the, it, it, yeah, it annihilates the, the momentum. I mean. Yeah. So to get your result, you made this sort of fundamental naturalness assumption. I'm that assuming that every, I'm. <laughs> every massive coupling is proportional to the same scale m times some c's, which you neglected here. So they must be of order unity. Mm -hmm. So why should we believe that? Or when should we believe it? Or when shouldn't we believe it? You don't really have to believe it. I mean, as long as. So for sure it's true as long as you're below the uh, mass of the lightest of the heavy scales. Uh, it's true that if you have the CNs, there may be hierarchies in them, and then life gets a bit more complicated. You may have m multiple expansions going on. I mean, for example, even if you try to uh, work in a theory that has a, a